Hello everyone. Welcome to this interesting session of Spark SQL tutorial from Edureka. So in today's session, we are going to learn about how we will be working with Spark SQL. Now, what all you can expect from this course, from this particular session? So you can expect that we will be first learning what is Spark SQL, why is Spark SQL, what are the libraries which are present in Spark SQL, what are the important features of Spark SQL, we will also be doing some hands-on example and in the end we will see some interesting use case of stock market analysis. Now why Spark SQL? Is it like um, why we are learning it? Why it is really important for us to know about this uh, Spark SQL site? Is it like really hot in market? If yes, then why? We want all those answers from this. So if you are coming from Hadoop background, you must have heard a lot about Apache Hive. Now, what happens in Apache Hive? So like in Apache Hive, SQL developers can write their queries in a SQL way and it will be getting converted to your MapReduce and giving you the output. Now, we all know that MapReduce is slower in nature. And since MapReduce is going to be slower in nature, then definitely your overall Hive query is going to be slower in nature. So that was one challenge. So if you have, let's say, less than 200 GB of data, or if you have a smaller set of data, this was actually a big challenge that in Hive, your performance was not that great. It also do not have any resuming capability. If you're stuck, you cannot start it. Also, Hive cannot even drop your encrypted databases. That was also one of the challenge when you deal with the security side. Now, what Spark SQL have done is, Spark SQL have solved almost all of the problem. So in the last sessions, we have already learned about the Spark way, right? How Spark is faster from MapReduce and all. We have already learned that in our previous few sessions. Now, so in this session, we are going to kind of take a leverage of all that. So definitely, in this case, since Apache Spark is faster because of the in-memory computation, what is in-memory computation? We have already seen it. So in-memory computations is like whenever we are computing anything in memory directly. So because of in-memory computation capability, because Apache Spark was faster, so definitely your Spark SQL is also going to become fast. Now, so if I talk about the advantages of Spark SQL over Hive, definitely number one, it is going to be faster in comparison to your Hive. So a Hive query, which is, let's say, uh, taking around 10 minutes, in Spark SQL, you can finish that same query in less than one minute. Don't you think it's an awesome capability of Spark SQL? Definitely, yes. Right? Now, second thing is, when if, let's say, you're writing something in Hive, now, you can take an example of, let's say, a company who is, let's say, developing Hive queries from last 10 years. Now, they were doing it, they were all happy that they were able to process big data, that they were worried about the performance that Hive is not able to give them a, that level of processing speed, what they are looking for. Now, this was, a, let's say, a challenge for that particular company. Now, there is a challenge, right? The challenge is, they came to know now about Spark SQL fine, let's say they came to know about it, but uh, they came to know that we can execute everything in Spark SQL and it is going to be faster as well, fine. But don't you think that if these companies working from let's say past 10 years in Hive, they must have already written a lot of code in Hive. Now if you ask them to migrate to Spark SQL, is, will it be an easy task? No, right? Definitely it is not going to be an easy task. Why? Because Hive syntax and Spark SQL syntax, though they both tackle the SQL way of writing the things, but at the same time, it is always a very, it, it carries a big difference. So there will be a good difference whenever we talk about the syntax between them. So it will take a very good amount of time for that company to change all of the query mode to the Spark SQL way. Now Spark SQL came up with a smart solution. What they said is, even if you're writing the query with Hive, you can execute that Hive query directly through Spark SQL. Don't you think it's again a very important and an awesome facility, right? Because even now, if you're a good Hive developer, you need not worry about that how you will be now migrating to Spark SQL. You can still keep on writing to Hive query and can your query will automatically be getting converted to Spark SQL. Uh, similarly, in Apache Spark, as we have learned in the past sessions, especially through Spark streaming, that 
Spark streaming is going to make you real time processing, right? You can also perform your real time processing using Apache Spark. Now this sort of facility is you can take leverage even in your Spark SQL. So let's say you can do a real time processing and at the same time you can also perform your SQL query. Now with Hive that was a problem. You cannot do that because when we talk about Hive, now in Hive it's all about, Hadoop is all about batch processing. Batch processing where you keep historical data and then later you process it, right? So it definitely Hive also follows the same approach. In this case also Hive is going to just only follow the batch processing mode. But when it comes to Apache Spark, it will also be taking care of the real time processing. So how all these things happens? So your Spark SQL always uses your Metastore services of your Hive to query the data stored and managed by Hive. So in when you were learning about Hive, so we have learned at that time that in Hive, everything what we do is always stored in the Metastore. So that Metastore was the crucial point, right? Because using that Metastore only, you were able to do everything up. So like when you're doing, let's say, your uh, any sort of query, or when you're creating a table, everything was getting stored in that same Metastore. Now what happens, Spark SQL also use the same Metastore. Now whatever Metastore you have created with respect to Hive, same Metastore you can also use it for your Spark SQL. And that is something which is really awesome about this Spark SQL, that you need not create a new Metastore, you need not worry about a new storage space and all. Everything what you have done with respect to your Hive, a same Metastore you can use it. Now you can ask me then how it is faster if they're using same Metastore. Remember the processing part. Why Hive was slower? Because of its processing way. Because it is converting everything to the map produce and thus it was making the processing very very slow. But here in this case since the processing is going to be in memory computation so in Spark SQL case it is always going to be the faster. Now definitely it just because of the meta store side we are only able to fetch the data and all but at the same time for any other thing of the processing related stuff it is always going to be at the when we talk about the processing stage it is going to be in memory thus it's going to be faster. So let's talk about some success stories of Spark SQL let's see some use cases. Twitter sentiment analysis. If you go through our, if you, once, if you remember our Spark streaming session, we have done a Twitter sentiment analysis, right? So there you have seen that we have first initially got the data from Twitter and that too we have got it with the help of Spark streaming. And later what we did, later we just analyzed everything with the help of Spark SQL. So you can see an advantage of Spark SQL. So in Twitter sentiment analysis, where let's say you want to find out about the uh, Donald Trump, Right? You are fetching the data every tweet related to the Donald Trump and then kind of doing analysis and checking that whether it's a positive tweet, negative tweet, neutral tweet, very negative tweet, very positive tweet. Okay, so we have already seen the same example there in that particular session. So in this session as you are noticing what we are doing, we just want to kind of show that once you are streaming the data in the real time, you can also do a processing using Spark SQL. Thus you are doing all the processing at the real time. Similarly in the stock market analysis you can use Spark SQL, lot of queries you can adopt there. In the banking fraud case transactions and all you can use that. So let's say your credit card currently is getting swiped in India and in next 10 minutes if your credit card is getting swiped in let's say in US, definitely that is not possible, right? So let's say you are doing all that processing real time, you are detecting everything with respect to Spark streaming. Then you are let's say applying your Spark SQL to verify that whether uh, it's a user trend or not, right? So all those things you want to match up with Spark SQL, so you can do that. Similarly, in the medical domain, you can use that. Let's talk about some Spark SQL features. So there will be some features related to it. Now, you can use what happens when the SQL got combined with the Spark, we started calling it as Spark SQL. Now, when definitely we are talking about SQL, we are talking about either a structured data or a semi-structured data. Now, SQL queries cannot deal with the unstructured data. So that is definitely one of the things you need to keep in mind. Now, your Spark SQL also support various data formats. You can get the data from Parquet. You must have heard about Parquet that it is a columnar based storage and it is kind of very much a compressed format of the data what you have, but it's not human readable. Similarly, you must have heard about JSON, Avro, where we keep the value as a key value pair, Hive, Cassandra, right? These are NoSQL DBs. So you can get all the data from these sources. Now you can also convert your SQL queries to your uh, RDD way. So you can, you can, you will be able to perform all the transformation step. So that is one thing you can do. Now, if we talk about performance and scalability, definitely on this red color, 
graph if you notice this is related to your Hadoop you can notice that red color graph is much more in comparison to blue color and blue color denotes my performance with respect to spark sql so you can notice that spark sql is performing much better in comparison to your Hadoop so we are on this y axis we are taking the running time on the x axis we were considering the number of iteration when we talk about spark sql features now a few more features we have for example you can create a connection with simple your JDBC driver or ODBC driver, right? These are simple drivers being present. Now you can uh, create your connection with your Spark SQL using all these drivers. You can also create a user defined function. Means, let's say if any function is not available to you, in that case, you can create your own function. So let's say if a function is available, use that. If it is not available, you can create a UDF, means user defined function, and you can directly execute that user defined function and get your desired result. So this is one example where we have shown that you can convert, let's say if you don't have an uppercase API present in Spark SQL, how you can create a simple UDF for it and can execute it. So if you notice here what we are doing, let's say this is my data. So if you notice in this case, this is data set is my data part, right? So this is I'm generating as a sequence. I'm creating it as a data frame. See this 2DF part here. Now after that, we are creating an upper UDF here. And notice we are converting any value which is coming to my uppercase, right? We are using this two uppercase API to convert it. We are importing this function. And then what we did? Now when we came here, we are telling that, okay, this is my UDF. So UDF is upper. Why? Because we have created here also as upper. So we are telling that this is my UDF in the first step. And then when we are using it, let's say with our data sets, what we are doing? So data sets we are passing here that, okay, whatever we are doing, convert it to my upper, upper UDF, right? So convert it to my uppercase. So see, we are telling you we have created our upper UDF. That is what we are passing inside this text value. So now it is just getting converted and giving you all the output in your uppercase way. So you can notice that this is your uh, last value and this is your uppercase value right so this got converted to my uppercase in this particular way now if you notice here also same step so we are how to we can register all of our UDF this is what being shown here so now this is how you can do that spark dot UDF dot register so using this API you can just register your data frames now similarly if you want to get the output after that, you can get it uh, using this following way. So you can use this show API to get the output for this. Spark SQL architecture, let's see that. So what is Spark SQL architecture? Now Spark SQL architecture, if we talk about, so what happens, so you're, let's say getting the data with using your various formats, right? So let's say you can get it from your CSV, you can get it from your JSON format, you can also get it from your JDBC format. Now there will be a data source API, so using data source API, you can fetch the data. After fetching the data, you will be converting to a data frame way. So what is data frame? So in the last one, we have learned that, that when we were creating everything is already what we were doing. So let's say this was my uh, cluster, right? So let's say this is machine, this is another machine, this is another machine. Right? So let's say these are all my clusters. So what we were doing in this case, now when we were creating all these things as our cluster, what was happening here? We were passing all of our values here. Right? So let's say we were keeping all the data, let's say block B1 was there. So we were passing all the values and were creating it in the form of in the memory and we were calling that as RDD. Now when we were working in SQL, we have to store the data which is a tabular data. Right? So let's say there is a table which is let's say having column details, let's say name, age, let's say here I have some value, here I have some value, here I have some value, here I have some value. Right? So let's say I have some value of this table format. Now if I have to keep this data into my cluster, what you need to do? So you will be keeping first of all into the memory. So you will be having let's say name, age, this column details first of all here. And after that you will be having some details of this data set. So let's say this much data you have. Some part, the similar kind of table with some other values will be here also. But here also you are going to have column details. You will be having name, age, some more data here. Now, if you notice, this is sounding similar to RDD, but this is not exactly like RDD, right? Because here we are not only keeping just the data, but we are also storing something like a column in storage, right? We are also keeping the column in all of our data nodes, or we can call it as a worker node, right? So we are also keeping the column details along with the row details. So this thing is called as data frames.
Okay, so that is called your data frame. So that is what we are going to do. So we are going to convert it to a data frame API. Then using the data frame DSLs or by using Spark SQL or HQL, uh, you will be processing the results and giving the output. We will learn about all these things in detail. So let's see the Spark SQL libraries. Now there are multiple APIs available to us. Like we have data source API, we have data frame API, we have interpreter and optimizer and SQL service. We will explore all this in detail now. So let's talk about data source API. If we talk about data source API, what happens here? In data source API, it is used to read and store the structured and unstructured data into your Spark SQL. So as you can notice, in Spark SQL, we can fetch the data using multiple sources, right? You can get it from Hive, Pick, Cassandra, CSV, Apache Base, DBase, Oracle DB, so many formats are available, right? So this API is going to help you to get all the data, to read all the data, store it wherever you want to use it. Now after that, your data frame API is going to help you to convert that into a named column and row. Remember I just explained you that uh, how you store the data and that because here you're not keeping it like a RDD. You're also keeping the named column as well as row details. That is the difference coming up here. So that is what it is converting in this case. So you are using data frame API to convert it into your named column and rows, right? So that is what you will be doing. So at, it also follows the same properties like your RDDs, like your RDDs were lazily evaluated and all, same properties will also follow up here, okay? Now, interpreter and optimizer. In interpreter and optimizer step, what we are going to do. So let's say if we have this data frame API. So we are going to first create this named column. Then after that, we will be now creating an RDD. We will be applying our transformation step. We will be doing our action step, right, to output the value. So all those things where it is happens, it is happening in the interpreter and optimizer step. So this is all happening in the interpreter and optimizer step. So this is what all the features you have. Now, let's talk about SQL service. Now in SQL service, what happens? It is going to again help you. So it is just doing all the transformation action in the last step. After that, using Spark SQL service, you will be getting your Spark SQL outputs. So now in this case, whatever processing you have done, right? In terms of transformations and all of that. So you can say that your Spark uh, SQL service is an entry point for working along the structured data in your Apache Spark, okay? So it is going to kind of help you to fetch the results from your optimized data or maybe whatever you have interpreted before. So that is what it's doing. So this kind of completes this whole uh, diagram. Now, let's see that how we can perform our queries using Spark SQL. Now, if we talk about Spark SQL queries, so first of all, we can go to Spark Shell itself and can execute everything. You can also execute your program using Spark, uh, your Eclipse also directly. From there also, you can do that. So if you are, let's say, log in with your Spark Shell session, so what you can do, so let's say you have first, you need to import this because in 2.x, you must have heard that there is something called a Spark session, which came up. So that is what we're doing. So in our last sessions, we have already learned about all these things up. Now, Spark session is something what we're importing. After that, we are creating a session Spark using a builder function. Look at this. So this builder API, you, we are using this builder API, then we are using the app name, we are providing our configuration, and then we are telling that we are going to create our values here, right? So we are, that's why we are giving get or create. Then we are importing all these things, right? Once we import it, after that we can say that, okay, we will want to read this JSON file, so this employee.json we want to read up here, and in the end we want to output this value, right? So this DF becomes my data frame containing the value of my employee.json. So this JSON value will get converted to my data frame. Way. Now in the end, we are just outputting the result. Now if you notice here what we are doing, so here we are first of all importing our Spark session. Same story, we are just executing it. Then we are building our things. We are telling that we are going to create that. Again, we are importing it. Then we are reading uh, our JSON file by using read.json API. We are reading our employee.json, okay, which is present in this particular directory, and we are outputting. So can you can see that JSON format will be the key value format. But when I'm doing this df.show, it is just showing up all my values here. Now let's see how we can create our data set. Now when we talk about data set, you can notice what we're doing. Now we have understood all this, so let's see the, how we can create the data set. Now first of all, 
in data set what we do so in data set we can create the class you can see we are creating a case class employee right now in case class what we are doing we are then just creating a sequence inputting the value Andrew age like name and the age column then we are displaying our output all this data set right now we are creating a primitive data set also to demonstrate mapping of this data frames to your data sets right so you can notice that we are using 2ds instead of 2df we are using 2ds in this case now you may ask me what's the difference with respect to data frame right so with respect to data frame in data frame what we were doing we were create again the data frame and data set both exactly look same it will also be having the name column and rows and everything up it is introduced lately in 1.6 versions and later and what is it provides it it provides an encoder mechanism using which you can get when you are let's say reading the weight data back let's say you are deserializing and not doing that step right it is going to be faster so the performance wise data set is better that's the reason it is introduced later nowadays our uh, people are moving from data frame to data set sites okay so now we are just outputting in the end see the same thing in the output part so we are creating employee class then we are putting the value inside it creating a data set we are looking at the values right so these are the steps we have just seen understood that now how we can read our file so we want to read the file so we will use read.json as employee employee was what remember case class which we have created last time this was the class we have created here, case class employee. So we are telling that we are creating like this. Then we are just outputting this value. We're just using show. You can see this way. We can see this output also. Now, let's see how we can add the schema to RDD. Now, in order to add the schema to RDD, what we are going to do? So in this case also, you can look at we are importing all the values. Right? We are importing all the libraries, whatever are required. Then after that, we are using this Spark context text file reading the data, uh, splitting it with respect to comma, then mapping the attributes to your employer case class what we have done, and putting converting these values to integer. So in then we are converting to 2df, right? After that, we are going to create a temporary view or table. So let's create this temporary view employee. Then we are going to use spark.sql and passing up our SQL query. Can you notice that we are now passing the value and we are assessing this employee, right? We are assessing this employee here. Now, what is this employee? This employee was our temporary view which we have created. Because the challenge in Spark SQL is whenever you want to execute any SQL query, you cannot say select a strict from a data frame. You cannot do that. This is not even supported. So you cannot do select a strict from your data frame. So instead of that, what we need to do is we need to create a temporary table or a temporary view. So you can notice here we are using this create or replace temp view. Why replace? Because if it is already existing, override on top of it. So now we are creating a temporary table which will be exactly similar to my this data frame. Now you can just directly execute all the query on your temporary view or temporary table. So you can notice here instead of using employee DF, which was our data frame, I'm using here temporary view. Okay, then in the end, we are just mapping the names and all, right? And we are outputting the values. That's it. Same thing. This is just an execution part of it, right? So we are just showing all the steps here. You can see in the end, we are outputting all this value. Now, how we can add this schema to RDD? Let's see this transformation step. Now, in this case, you can notice that we can map this youngster, right? So we are converting this map name into the string for the transformation part, right? So we are checking all this value that, okay, this is uh, the string type name. We are just showing up this value, right? Now, what we are you doing? We are using this map encoder from the implicit class, which is available to us to map the name and age part. Okay, so this is what we are going to do because remember in the employee case class we have the name and the age column that we want to map now. Now in this case we are mapping the names to the ages. So you can notice that we are doing for ages of our younger DF data frame that what we have created earlier and the result is an array. So the result what you are going to get will be an array with the name mapped to your respective ages. You can see this output here. So you can see that this is getting mapped, right? So we are getting seeing this output like name is John, age is 28. That is what we are talking about. So here in this case, you can notice that it was representing like this. In this case, the output is coming out in this particular format. Now, let's talk about how we can add the schema, how we can read the file, we can add our schema and all. So we will be first of all importing the type class into your Spark shell. So this is what we are done by using import statement. 
Then we are going to import the row class into this partial. So row will be used in mapping RDD schema, right? So you can notice we are importing this also. Then we are creating an RDD called as employee RDD. So in case, this case, you can notice that as employee RDD we are creating, and we are creating this with the help of this text file. So once we have created this, we are going to define our schema. So this is the schema approach. Okay. So in this case, we are going to define it like name, then space, then age. Okay. Because these these were the two I have in my data also. In this employee.txt, if you look at, these are the two data which we have: name and age. Now what we can do? Once we have done that, then we can split it with respect to space. We can say that our mapping value, and we are passing it all this value inside our struct field. Okay, so we are defining our now fields RDD. That is what we are doing here. See this uh, fields RDD, which is going to now output after mapping the employee RDD. Okay, so that is what we are doing. So we want to just uh, do this into my schema string. Then in the end, we will be obtaining this field. If you notice this field, what we have created here, we are obtaining this into a schema. So we are passing this into a struct type, and it is getting converted to be your schema bit. So that is what we will do. You can see all this execution. Same steps we are just executing in this terminal. Now let's see how we are going to transform the results. Now whatever we have done, right? So now we have already created a RDD called row RDD. So let's create that row RDD we are going to create, and uh, we want to transform the employee RDD using the map function into row RDD. So let's do that. Okay. So in this case, what we are doing? So look at this employee RDD. We are splitting it with respect to comma. And after that, we are telling. See, remember, we have name and then age like this. So that's what we are telling. We are telling that attribute zero, comma attributes one. And why we are trimming it? Just in order to ensure if there is no spaces and all which are there. So those things we don't want to unnecessarily keep up. So that's the reason we are defining this trim statement. Now, after that, after we once we are done with this. We are going to define a data frame employee DF, and we are going to store that RDD schema into it. So now, if you notice this row RDD which we have defined here, and schema which we have defined in the last case, right? Now, if you go back and notice here, schema we have created here, right, with respect to my fields. So that schema and this value what we have just created here. Row RDD. We are going to pass it and say that we are going to create a data frame. So this will help us in creating the data frame. Now we can create our temporary view on the base of employee DF. Let's create an employee or uh, temporary view, and then what we can do? We can execute any SQL queries on top of it. So as you can see, Spark dot SQL. We can create all the SQL queries. And can directly execute that. Now, what we can do? If we want to output the values, we can quickly do that. Now, we want to let's say display the name, so we can say, okay, attribute zero contains the name. We can use this show command. So this is how we will be performing the operation in the schema way. Now, so this is the same output way. Means we are just executing this whole thing up. You can notice here also we are just saying attribute zero dot show. It is representing all me my output. Now, let's talk about JSON data. Now, when we talk about JSON data, let's talk about how we can load our files and work on this. So, in this case, we will be first, let's say, importing our libraries. Once we are done with that, now after that, we can just say that read dot JSON. We are just bringing up our employee dot JSON here. See, this is the execution of this part. Now, similarly, we can also write back in the parquet, or we can also read the value from parquet. You can notice this if we want to write, let's say, this uh, value employee DF data frame. To my parquet way, so I can say write dot write dot parquet. So this will be created. Employee dot parquet will be created, and here all the values will be converted to employee dot parquet. Only thing is the data. If you go and see in this particular directory, this will be a directory which will be getting created. So in this data, you will notice that you will not be able to read the data. So in that case, because it's not human readable, so that's the reason you will not be able to do that. So let's say you want to read it now. So you can again bring it back by using read dot parquet. You are reading this employee dot parquet which you have just created. Then you are creating a temporary view or temporary table, and then by using Spark dot SQL you can execute on your temporary table. Now in this way you can read your parquet file data, and in the end we are just displaying the result. See the similar output of this. Okay, this is how we can execute all these things up. Now once we have done all this, let's see how we can create our data frames. So let's create this file path. So let's say we have created this file employee dot JSON. After that, we can create a data frame from our JSON path, right? So we are creating this by using read dot JSON. Then we can print the schema. What does do? This is going to print the schema of my employee data frame. 
okay so we are going to use this print schema to print up all the values then we can create a temporary view of this data frame so we are create doing that see create or replace temp view we are creating that which we have seen it last time also now after that we can execute our sql query so let's say we are executing our sql query from employee where age is between 18 and 30 right so this kind of sql query let's say we want to do we can get that and in the end we can see the output also let's see this execution so you can see that all the employees whose age are let's say between 18 and 30 that is showing up in the output now let's see this RDD operation way. Now what you can do? So we are going to create this RDD other employee RDD. Now which is going to store the content of employee George and New Delhi Delhi. So see this part. So here we are creating this by using make RDD and we have just this is going to store the content containing George from New Delhi. Right? You can see this. So New Delhi is my city name. State is Delhi. So that is what we are passing inside it. Now what we are doing? We are assigning the content of this other employee RDD into my other employee. So we are using this park.read.json and we are reading up the value. And in the end, we are using this show API. You can notice this output coming up. Now let's see with the hive table. So with the hive table, if you want to read that, so let's do it with the case class and spark sessions. So first of all, we are going to import our row class and we are going to use spark session into the spark session. So let's do that. So we are importing this row, this spark session and all. After that, we are going to create a class record containing this key, which is of integer data type and a value, which is of string type. Then we are going to set our location of the warehouse location okay, to the Spark warehouse. So that is what we are doing. Now we are going to build a Spark session Spark to demonstrate the Hive example in Spark SQL. Look at this now. So we are creating Spark session dot builder. Again, we are passing the uh, any app name to it. We are passing the configuration to it. And then we are saying that we want to enable the Hive support. Now, once we have done that, we are importing this uh, Spark SQL libraries and all. And then you can notice that we can use SQL. So we can create now a table SRC. So you can see create table if not exist SRC with column to store the data as a key comma value pair. So that is what we are doing here. Now you can see all this execution of the same step. Now let's see the SQL operation happening here. Now in this case, what we can do, we can now load the data from this example, uh, which is present now. So you see this, this kvm.txt file, which is available to us. And we want to store it into the table SRC, which we have just created. And now if you want to just view the, all this output, we can say SQL, select a stack from SRC, and it is going to show up all the values. You can see this output, okay? So this is the way you can show up the values. Now similarly, we can perform the count operation. Okay, so we can say select count strict from SRC to select the number of keys in the SRC tables. And now, now select all the records, right? So we can say that key select key comma value. So you can see that we can perform all of our hive operations here on this, right? Similarly, we can create a data set string DS from Spark DF. So you can see this also by using SQL DF what we already have. We can just say map and then provide the case class and can map this key comma value pair. And then in the end, we can show up all this value. See this execution of this. In the end, you can notice this output, which we wanted. Now let's see the result part. Now we can create our data frame here, right? So we can create our data frame records DF and store all the results which contains the value between 1 to 100. So we are storing all the values between 1 to 100 here. Then we are creating our temporary view, okay, for the records. That's what we are doing. So for records DF, we are creating a temporary view so that we can have our all of our SQL queries. Now we can execute all the values. So you can also notice we are doing join operation here. Right? So we can display the content of join between the records and this uh, SRC table. We can do a join on this part. So we can also perform all the join operations and get the output. Now let's see our use case for it. If we talk about use case, we are going to analyze our stock market with the help of Spark SQL. So let's understand the problem statement first. So now in our problem statement, so what we want to do, so we want to, so definitely everybody must be aware of this stock market. Like in stock market, you can, a lot of activities happen. You want to know, analyze it in order to make some profit out of it and all those stuff, right? So now let's say a company have collected a lot of data for different 10 companies and they want to do some computation. Let's say they want to compute the average closing price. They want to list the companies with the highest closing prices. They want to compute the average closing price per month. They want to list the number of big price rises and fall and compute some statistical correlation. So these things we are going to do with the help of our Spark SQL statement. So this is our requirement. 
we want to process the huge data we want to handle the input from the multiple sources we want to process the data in real time and it should be easy to use it should not be very complicated so all this requirement will be handled by my spark sql right so that's the reason we are going to use the spark uh, sql so as i just said that we are going to use 10 companies so we are going to kind of use these 10 companies and on those 10 companies we are going to see that we are going to perform our analysis on top of it so we will be using the stock data from yahoo finance for all these following stocks so for Enon, AA, Bits, Axis, so all these companies we have on, on which we are going to perform. So this is how my data will look like, which will be having date, opening, high rate, low rate, closing, volume, adjusted, close, all this data will be present here. Now, so let's see how we can implement a stock analysis using Spark SQL. So what we have to do for that, so this is how my data flow diagram will sound like. So we are going to initially have the huge amount of real-time stock data that we are going to process it with Spark SQL, so going to convert it into a named column way. Then we are going to create an RDD for functional programming, so let's do that. Then we are going to use our Spark SQL, which will calculate the average closing price per year, calculating the company with highest closing per year. Then by Spark SQL queries, we will be getting our outputs, okay? So that is what we are going to do. So all the queries what we are getting generated, so it's not only this, we are also going to compute few other queries what we have. So all those queries we are going to execute it. Now this is how the flow will look like. So we are going to initially have this data what I have just shown you up. Now what you are going to do, you are going to create a data frame. You are going to then create a join close RDD. We will see what we are going to do here. Then we are going to calculate the average closing price per year. We are going to hit our Spark SQL query and get the result in the table. So this is how my execution will look like. So what we are going to do in this case, first of all, we are going to initialize the Spark SQL in the Spark Shell. We are going to import all the required libraries. Then we are going to start our Spark session after importing all the required library. We are going to create our case class, whatever is required here in the case class you can notice here. Then we are going to define our parse stock schema. So because we have already learned how to create a schema, so we are going to create this parse stock schema by creating this way. But then we are going to define our parse RDD. So in parse RDD if you notice, so here we are creating this parse RDD, right? So we are going to create all of that by using this RDD first, we are going to remove the header files also from it. Then we are going to read our CSP file into stocks AA on DF data frame. So we are going to read this sc.txt file, you can see we are reading this file and we are going to convert it into a data frame. So we are parsing it as an RDD. Once we are done, then if we want to print the output, we can do it with the help of show API. Once we are done with this, now we want to let's say display the average of adjacent closing price for NN for every month. So we can do all of that also by using select query, right? So we can say uh, this data frame dot select and pass whatever parameters are required to get the average now. So you can notice here inside this, we are creating the alias of the things as well. So for this DT, we are creating alias here, right? So we are creating the alias for it, you know? now and then we are showing the output also. So here what we are going to do, now we will be checking that the closing price for Microsoft. So let's say they're going up by two or, with greater than two or wherever it is going by greater than two and one, we want to get the output and display the result. So you can notice that wherever it is going to be greater than two, we are getting the value. So we are hitting the SQL query to do that. So we are hitting the SQL query now on this. You can notice the SQL query which we are hitting on the stocks MSFT, right? This is the, we have data frame we have created. Now on this, we are doing that and we are putting our query that where my condition this to be true, means where my closing price and my opening price because let's say at the closing price uh, the stock price was let's say 100 US dollars and at the time in the morning when it opened with the let's say 98 US dollar so wherever it is going to be having a difference of 2 or greater than 2 that only output we want to get so that is what we are doing here now once we are done then after that what we are going to do now we are going to use the join operation so what we are going to do, so we will be joining the NN and XFB stocks in order to compare the closing price because we want to compare the prices. So we will be doing that. So first of all, we are going to create a union of all these stocks and then display this joint close. So look at this, what we are going to do. We are going to use the Spark SQL. And if you notice this closely, what we are doing in this case. So now in the Spark SQL, we are hitting this query SQL and all those stuff. Then we are saying from this and here we are using this join operation, right? See? this join operation. So this we are joining it on 
and then in the end we are outputting it so here you can see you can do a comparison of all this close price for all these stocks you can also include now for more companies right now we have just shown you an example with two companies but you can do it for more companies as well now in this case if you notice what we're doing we're writing this in the parquet file format and saving into this particular location so we are creating this joint stock dot parquet so we are storing it as a parquet file format and here if you want to read it we can read that and show the output but whatever file you have saved it as a parquet file definitely you will not be able to read that up because that file is going to be the parquet way and parquet way are the files which you can never read you will not be able to read them up now you will be seeing this average closing price per year i'm going to show you all these things running also so i'm just right now explaining you how things will be run, uh, doing up here so i will be showing you all these things in execution as well now in this case if you notice what we are doing Again, we are creating our data frame here. Again, we are executing our query. Whatever table we have, we are executing on top of it. So in this case, because we want to find the average closing per year. So what we are doing in this case, so we are going to create a new table containing the average closing price of, let's say, Annan, Abax, and Fast. And then we are going to display all this new table. So we are in the end, we are going to register this table also as a temporary table so that we can execute our SQL queries on top of it. So in this case, you can notice that we are creating this new table. And in this new table, we are putting our SQL query, right? That SQL query is going to contains the average closing price. So the SQL query is finding out the uh, average closing price of NN and all these companies. Then whatever we have, now we are going to apply our transformation step. Now transformation of this new table which we have created with the year and the corresponding three company data what we have created into the company or table so let you can notice that we are creating this company or table and here first of all we are going to create a transform table company or and going to display the output so you can notice that we are hitting the sql query and in the end we are printing this output Similarly, if you want to, let's say, compute the best of average close, we can do that. So in this case, again, the same way. Now, if once you have learned the basic stuff, you can notice that everything is following a similar approach. Now, in this case, also, we want to find out, let's say, the best of the average closing. So we are creating this best company here. Now, it should contain the best average closing price of Annan, Abex, and Fast. So we can just get this greatest and all that, right? So we're creating that. Then after that, we are going to display this output and we will be again registering it as a temporary table. Now, once we have done that, then we can hit our queries now. So we want to check, let's say, best performing company per year. So what we have to do for that? So we are creating a final table in which we are going to compute all the things. So we are going to perform the join and all. So all those SQL query we are going to perform here in order to compute that which company is uh, doing the best. And then we are going to display the output. So this is what the output is being showing up here. We are again storing as a temporary view and here again the same story of correlation what we're going to do here. So now we will be using our statistics libraries to find the correlation between Annan and Abex companies closing price. So that is what we are going to do now. So correlation in finance and the investment industries is a statistics that measures the degree to which two securities move in relation to each other. So the closer the correlation is to be one, this is going to be a better one. So it is always like how two variables are correlated with each other. Let's say your age is highly correlated to your salary what you're earning, right? When you are young, you usually earn less. And when you are more age, definitely you will be earning more because you will be more mature. Similar way, I can say that your salary is also dependent on your education qualification and also on the premium institute from where you have done your education. Let's say if you are from IIT or IM, definitely your salary will be higher from any other campuses, right? Means it's a probability with what I'm telling you. So let's say if I have to correlate now in this case, the education and the salary part, I can easily create a correlation, right? So that is what the correlation goes. So we are going to do all that with respect to our stock analysis now. Now what we are doing in this case, so again you can notice we are creating this series one where we are hitting the select query. Now we are mapping all this uh, and in close price, we are converting to RDD. Similar way for series two also we are doing that, right? So this is we are doing for ABEX. So earlier we have done it for and in close. And then in the end we are using the statistics.core to create a correlation between them. So you can notice this is how we can execute everything. Now let's go to our VM and see everything in our execution. A question from Atul. 
So this VM, how we will be getting? You will be getting all this VM from Edureka. So you need not worry about all that part. That how I will be getting all this VM, you know. So uh, once you enroll for the courses and also you will be getting all this VM from the Edureka side. So even if I'm working on Mac operating system, my VM will work. Yes, every operating system it will be supported. So no trouble. You can just use any sort of VM and all means uh, any operating system to do that. So what I do, Edureka do is they just don't want you to be troubled in uh, any sort of stuff here. So what they do is they kind of ensure that uh, whatever is required for your practicals, they take care of it. That's the reason they have created their own VM, which is also going to be a lower size in comparison to Cloudera Hortonworks VM. And this is going to definitely be more helpful for you. So all these things will be provided to you. Question from Nitin. So all this project I'm going to learn from the sessions. Yes. So once you enroll for, so right now whatever we have seen, definitely we have just got an upper level of uh, view of this, how the session looks like for Apache Spark. But when we actually teach all these things in the course, it's usually are much more in the detailed format. So in detail format, we kind of keep on showing you each step in detail that how the things are working, even including the project. So you will be also learning with the help of project on each different topic. So that is the way we kind of go for it. Now, if I am stuck in any other project, then who will be helping me? So there will be a support team 24 by 7. If you are stuck at any moment, you need to just give a call, Ankit, and a call or an email. There is a support ticket, and immediately the technical team will be helping you across. So the support team is 24 by 7. They are, they are all technical people, and they will be assisting you across on all that. Even the trainers will be assisting you for any of the technical query. Uh, great, awesome. Thank you. Now, so if you notice, this is my data. We have we were executing all the things on this data. Now, what we want to do, if you notice, this is the same code which I have just shown you earlier also. Now, let us just execute this code. So, in order to execute this, what we can do, we can connect to my Spark shell. So, let's get connected to Spark shell. So, once we'll be connected to Spark shell, we will go step by step. So, first, we will be importing our package. This takes some time. Let it uh, just get connected. Once this is connected, now you can notice that I'm just importing all the uh, all the important libraries. We have already learned about that. After that, you will be initializing your Spark session. So let's do that. Again, the same steps what we have done before. Once we will be done, we will be creating a stock class. We could have also directly executed from Eclipse also. This is just I want to show you step by step whatever we have learned. So now you can see for company one and then if we want to do some computation, we want to even see the values and all, right? So that's what we are doing here. So we are just getting the files, creating an RDD and all. So let's execute this. Similarly for your ABEX, similarly for your FAST, for all this. So I'm just copying all these things together because there are a lot of companies for which we have to do all this step. So let's bring it for all the 10 companies which we are going to create. So as you can see, this print schema is giving you the output, right? Now similarly, I can execute for the rest of the uh, things as well. So this is just giving you the similar way all the outputs will be shown up here, right? Company 4, company 5, all these companies, you can see this in execution. After that, we will be creating our temporary view so that we can execute our SQL queries. So let's do it for company 10 also. Then after that, we can just create our all our temporary table for it. Once we are done, now we can do our queries, right? Like let's say we can display the average of adjusting closing price for and for each month. So we can hit this query. So all these queries will happen on your temporary view. Because we cannot anyway do all these queries on our uh, data frames and all. So you can see this. This is getting executed. Showing you the output also. Now, because we have done dot show, that's the reason you are getting this output. Similarly, if we want to, let's say, list the closing price for MSFT, which went up more than $2, right? So that query also we can execute now. We have already understood this query in detail. We are just seeing this execution part now, so that you can appreciate whatever you have learned. See, this is the output showing up to you. Now, after that, 
how you can join all the stack closing price, right? Similar way how we can save the join view in the parquet flat table. You want to read that back. You want to create a new table, right? So let's execute all these three queries together because we have already seen this. Look at this. So this, in this case, we are doing the join class. We are seeing this output. Then we want to save it in the parquet files. So we are saving it. Then we want to again read it back. Then we are creating our new table, right? Where we were doing that join and all. So that is what we are doing in this case. Then we want to see this output. Then we are again storing as a temp table and all. Now once we are done with this step also, then what? So we have done it till step 6. Now we want to perform, let's say, a transformation on new table corresponding to the three companies so that we can compare. We want to create the best company containing the best average closing price for all these three companies. We want to find the companies with the best closing price average per year. So let's do all that as well. So you can see best company of the year, right? Now here also the same stuff we are doing. So we are registering our temp table. Okay, so there's a mistake here. So uh, if you notice here, it is one, but here we are doing a show of uh, all, right? So there's a mistake here. I'm just correcting it. So here also it should be one. I'm just updating in the sheet itself so that it will start working now. So here I've just made it one. So now after that, it will start working. Okay, wherever it is going to be all, I have to make it one. So that is the change which I need to do here also. And you will notice it will start working. So here also I need to make it one. So all those places wherever it was, so just uh, kind of a good point to make. So wherever uh, you are working on this, you need to always ensure that all these values what you are putting up here. Okay, so I could have also done it like this. One second. In fact, in this place, I need not do all this step. One second. Let me explain you also why. No. In this place, it's good. So see, from here, this error started occurring. Why? Because my data frame, what I have created here was one. Let's execute it. Now you will notice this will start working. See, this is working now. Now, after that, I'm creating a temp table. That temp table, what we are creating is, let's say, company. Here. Okay? So this is the temp table which we have created now. You can see this company. Here. Now, in this case, if I'm keeping this company all itself, it is going to work. Because here anyway I'm going to use the whatever temporary table we have created, right? So now let's execute. So you can see now it started working, right? Now, further to that, now we want to create a correlation between them. So we can do that. See, this is going to give me the correlation between the two column names. You know? So that's we can see here. So this is the correlation. The more it is closer to 1, means the better it is. It means definitely it is near to 1. It is 0 0.9, which is a bigger value. So definitely it is going to be much, uh, they, they both are highly correlated. It means definitely they are impacting each other's stock price. So this is all about the project part. Now, I hope all of you have enjoyed this session of Spark SQL. So this is uh, all which we wanted to go through. Again, as I said, uh, this was just a high level overview of Spark SQL. Once you learn this, all these things from Edureka, when you uh, kind of get enrolled from in detail, definitely it is going to kind of create much better view in terms of you will be kind of uh, learning a lot, uh, like in terms of in all these things in detail. All these things, once you go in a proper session format, things will be more clearer but I hope you have enjoyed this all this spark SQL content whatever we have seen you have enjoyed this uh, even this project session any questions from anyone great so how I can enroll with Edureka this course yes Mohit so what you need to do in this case you just need to kind of talk with the support team they will be telling you all the classes from your Edureka courses site also you can get to know all these things that where exactly or, or it will be mentioned about the batches timings and all so regularly the batches happens and you just need to go ahead and uh, kind of enroll for it or you can take the help of support teams so the contact number will be mentioned in the page you can just call them up and they will be assisting you on all that that uh, how you can actually get enrolled for whatever batch
Mayank is saying nice session informative. Thank you Mayank. So thank you everyone. This is all about Spark SQL. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply to them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to our Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.